was doing some teaching the other week and we were in a cadaver talking about the pericardium and there was some confusion about the phrenic nerve. So I thought I'll do a quick video about the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is, is really, really important. There are two of them, there's one on either side. The reason they're so important is that they innovate the major muscle of respiration. Um, so let's have a talk about what the phrenic nerve does. It has sensory roles as well. And there's a bit about referred pain that's important. And we can talk about where it appears in the neck and how it gets down to the diaphragm. Got back from Amsterdam in the early hours of the other morning and students tell me I have a little bit less energy than usual. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Anywho, um, so the functions of the phrenic nerve. I've said that it innervates the diaphragm, so it has motor innervation to the diaphragm, the major muscle that changes the volume within the thorax and helps us breathe in and breathe out. Um, but it's also sensory from the, the pericardium. Do you remember we looked at the pericardium uh, there's the fibrous pericardium, the thick, tough connective tissue um, sheets surrounding the, but the heart and holding it in place. Um, and it's also sensory from the diaphragm, certainly from the central diaphragm. Around the outside here, of course, we've got intercostal nerves and the subcostal nerve, and those are also going to innervate uh, the bits of the diaphragm around the outside. Uh, and it's also um, sensory from the other structures that it passes nearby. So as we go down, have a think about that. But it's not just sensory from the pericardium, it's also sensory from the mediastinal pleura, the parietal pleura that's next to it. Of course, the inferior surface of the diaphragm is covered with peritoneum. So it's also sensory from areas of the peritoneum. So what happens if you injure the phrenic nerve then? Right, well there are, as I said, there are two phrenic nerves, one on either side, so you can imagine them as, as innervating half of the diaphragm each. So obviously if you cut a phrenic nerve, you'll lose the sensory functions that we talked about. Um, but the, the most important thing you'll lose is motor function to half of the diaphragm. So if half of the diaphragm is then weak, the muscle is weak and it won't contract, this means that when you breathe in, normally the diaphragm would be pulled down, the muscle would contract, the volume inside the thorax would increase and you would breathe air in. When you breathe out, the diaphragm relaxes, returns to a dome position, the volume inside the thorax decreases and air is pushed out, right? So that's what normally happens. But if one side is weak, when you, when you breathe in and you're trying to increase the volume in the thorax, the, the paralyzed part of the diaphragm, the paralyzed or weak hemidiaphragm, is actually going to get pulled upwards by that, that change in pressure. So, you, so it'll work in, in the opposite direction to, to expected. So if the hemidiaphragm is paralyzed, when you breathe in, it'll go up, the other side will go down, and when you breathe out, um, the working side will go back up again, and the, the weak or paralyzed side will kind of resettle back to its neutral position. Paradoxical. Weird, huh? How could this nerve be damaged? Um, well, it's visible in the neck here, so it could be damaged by trauma to the neck, but of course once it's passed into the thoracic cage, it's fairly well protected. So it could be damaged uh, by trauma through surgery, um, if a surgeon is working in this area. Um, it could be damaged by, you know, neuropathological conditions, of, you know, conditions that damage nerves generally can damage the phrenic nerves. Um, but also, uh, you've got to consider tumours inside the thoracic cage. So a lung tumour, if it's medial in the lung, it could press on the phrenic nerve and cause phrenic nerve dysfunction. Um, and in itself, um, damage to the phrenic, phrenic nerve isn't often immediately obvious in a patient. You would have to look quite carefully for it because there are so many other muscles involved in, in respiration, in breathing in and out, that, that um, it's kind of compensated for, right? Okay, so an interesting note about sensory innovation and referred pain, something that you might have experienced yourself. The phrenic nerves are going to pass through the diaphragm and innervate the diaphragm from the inferior surface. 
Um, and uh, the sensory information carried back is, is pain and proprioceptive and stuff like that. So when the diaphragm is irritated, the phrenic nerve is carrying that innervation back to the roots of the phrenic nerve, which are in the neck. So when you're running, on the right side, you've got the liver, which is suspended from the diaphragm. So the liver may well be bouncing up and down and irritating the diaphragm, causing an unpleasant sensation called a stitch, right? So you tend to get a stitch on the right side. If you get a stitch on the left side, it's possibly because you just filled your stomach with water and it's doing the same thing. The stomach is irritating the diaphragm. So because of these intercostal and subcostal nerves that are innervated in the diaphragm here, you feel the pain localized ooh, down here. But if you keep going, you tend to find the pain moves up into the shoulder and this is referred pain. So the pain is referred to the shoulder because the, su the supraclavicular nerves are also coming out of the neck at the same levels of the phrenic nerve and they're innervating the skin around here. And it seems to be because those nerves are entering the spinal cord at the same level, the brain perceives that pain as coming from up here, whereas really the pain is in the diaphragm down here. And this is something we often see with viscera because we're we're not used to feeling pain from organs, from viscera, but we're used to feeling sensation from the skin. We have grown up learning that, then uh, pain often gets referred to places where the pain actually isn't. Uh, and you can use this in clinical testing. There are a number of things you can do to, to see if there is blood in the peritoneum and that sort of thing. And if someone's, uh, to, to see if someone's diaphragm is irritated, causing shoulder pain. So what is the root of the phrenic nerve then? C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So spinal nerves C3, C4 and C5, mostly C4, form the phrenic nerve and uh, we have a number of muscles here. So here's sternocleidomastoid, we have to look deep to sternocleidomastoid, then we can see the scalene muscles. Uh, the scalene muscles, there are three of them, anterior, middle and posterior, and between the anterior and middle scalene muscles we see the brachial plexus appearing, that's this big bundle of yellow here. But between the anterior and middle scalene muscles we also see the phrenic nerve appearing, this is where it pops out from those three roots. It then moves on to the anterior surface of the anterior scalene muscle, and this is how I find the phrenic nerve when I'm dissecting. I look for the muscle and then I look for the nerve around here. And it's going to descend, and as it descends it's going to come across the subclavian vein. I am tired. It's going, to cross the, come, it's going to come across the subclavian vein and the subclavian artery and we can see on this model and we see in, in the body that the phrenic nerve on both sides will pass posterior to the, to the subclavian vein and anterior to the subclavian artery. Um, and then it, at that point then it is disappearing deep to the clavicles and is moving into the, the thoracic cage. Do I want to take you apart, wee man? Not really. Let's get an easier model to take apart. The, um, the phrenic nerves on both sides continue down into the thorax and here we have the structures at the, the, the root of the lung. So the phrenic nerve is going to run anterior to the structures of the root of the lung and now we're getting to the heart. The heart, remember, is covered in the pericardium so the phrenic nerve is going to travel kind of between the pericardium and the um, the mediastinal pleura. I mean, they're like they're like layers of fascia. They're serous membranes. They're, you know, they're. <laughs> we're talking about two layers, like two layers, two sheets of paper, and the phrenic nerve is kind of between them. But really, the phrenic nerve blends with them as much as anything else. Uh, when we look inside the body, when we dissect the phrenic nerve out, as it runs down here, it disappears into the pericardium, and we kind of have to tease it out of the pericardium. That's where it really runs to. And then it continues to descend, and on the right side, if I take the heart out, of course we've got this very convenient hole here. This is the hole for the inferior vena cava. So the right phrenic nerve is going to go through the hole for the inferior vena cava, and then it passes to the inferior surface of the diaphragm, whereas the right phrenic nerve is going to pierce through the diaphragm and innervate the inferior surface of the diaphragm. And in that way, the phrenic nerve is going to 
innovate the muscle of the diaphragm, sensory innovation from the diaphragm, and it's going to carry sensory innovation back from the parietal, well, from the, from the um, fibrous pericardium and the parietal mediastinal pleura. And that's it. That's the course of the phrenic nerve. Now, if you can imagine that inside your minds, then you can imagine how, of course, remember everything is very closely packed together inside this space, just as it is in other parts of the body. So you can imagine how a mass forming in the lung on the medial side could push into that phrenic nerve. It's an important nerve. Um, the anatomy is quite straightforward. It's well worth you knowing about it. All right, and next time you get a pain in the shoulder, <laughs> um, you can think about your diaphragm, especially if you're out running. If you do go running and you get a stitch, just run more. Everything seems to firm up and get stronger and stitches go away, trust me. And if you get a stitch on the left side when you're running, well, just stop drinking water before you go running. You don't need to drink water when you're running, you'll be fine. A little bit of thirsty is fine for like 30 minutes, yeah? Anyway, see you guys next week. Okay, I should stop talking about running.